I used to think my divorce was the end of the story. I thought my addiction was all there was for me. I believed the lie that I was abandoned because I was too messed up. I thought there was no way out of my pain and suffering, no way to bring healing. But Jesus brings a different story and a different way of living. Our brokenness, our shame, our guilt, our sin, they are not the final word on us or who we are. They don't define us. The cross has the final word. It's so good. It's so good. Hey, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Easter at Mountain Springs. I'm thrilled that you chose to come this weekend. Whether you're here in this room, whether you're in our lobby venue, or whether you're streaming online, as my mom is right now from England. Hi, mom. Hey, we're so thrilled. Happy Easter to all of you. We're thrilled that you are here and celebrating Easter with us. That video raises a great question, doesn't it? And it raises the question of how will we live life based upon situations and circumstances in our lives that bring pain, that tear us down, that wear us down? And that video really creates a great conversation around the thought of divorce, pain, loss, suffering, grief, grief. because if you're anything like me, it's easy to allow your life story to define the remainder of your life. You had a situation that bothered you, but then you came to a point of realizing life is not turning out the way that I wanted it to. Raise your hand right now if you can remember the point where life didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to. Everyone raised their hand, right? Because life is challenging. Life is tough. 25 years ago, I remember as if it were yesterday, it was a profound moment in my life. I stood at an Easter celebration almost 25 years ago to the day to where I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I traded my sin, traded my life, traded my brokenness, traded my suffering at that point of my life for the righteousness of God. That's what Easter is all about. Easter is about the love of God, that it draws us to a point of repenting because of our struggle and our sin and receiving the breakthrough in Jesus Christ. And since that moment, 25 years ago, as I stood in a room not too dissimilar from this one, probably twice as big, and I stood and I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, my life has been forever changed. And I've given my life to loving God and receiving the love of God in my life. And I'm telling you what, I am obsessed and I'm so passionate about this. I want to learn more about Jesus. And I want to declare his love to people for them to realize that he loves them. That's what Easter is about. And that's what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes. So if you want to follow along, we're going to do a passage in Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is the final chapter of St. Matthew's Evangelion, gospel, good news. Not the good advice, the good news, the good news of Jesus. Well, if you know anything about Matthew or the gospel of Matthew, the end part of Matthew 28 is the crucifixion. Then it goes into the resurrection. And it's the part of where Jesus rises again. This is an incredible account to where at that point in history, the Romans at that point are really relieved. Why? Because they're hoping that there will be some civility returned to the streets of their communities. Why? Because Jesus at that point had brought such civil unrest. The religious community, the Pharisees at that point were like, okay, this is awesome. Our competition has gone. Remember, three days of death, three days of nothing. So much so the disciples at that point in their lives, they're terrified. They're terrified and saying, this is not the way that we thought life would turn out. So what I want to do is I want to look at 10 verses here of what I think is probably the boldest paragraph ever written. Verse 1 of Matthew 28 says this. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Bear in mind, by the way, can you imagine being called the other Mary? Oh, you're Mary. Oh, no, you're not Mary. You're the other Mary. That's right. That's right. Well, anyway, the two ladies, they go to the empty tomb. Why did they go there? Well, for three days, for 72 hours, they had wept. They had cried. They had mourned. They had prayed. They had sought, what is going on in my life? Three days of incredible disappointment, disillusionment, to where so much so they had cried to where they couldn't cry anymore. So they went to see the tomb. They went to the graveside. We all have a graveside of our lives. 
In some cases, we have a literal gravesite that we go to visit, and you know the sharp emotions that are connected to going to a gravesite. I went to the gravesite of my grandfather last summer, and it has a sharpness to the emotions, the memories, the loss, the grief, but the enjoyment of knowing that person at one time. Well, Mary and Mary go to the tomb, not aware that it would be an empty tomb, but they go there. How many of you in this room would say over the last few months, you have cried and cried and cried to almost to where you cannot cry anymore? To where you get up in the morning and you go, we cannot keep grieving that same situation. I cannot keep being worried about that same situation. In life, we will experience disappointment. If you're following along in the app or if you've got the program in front of you and you want to fill in the blanks there in front of you, the first blank is the disappointment. The disappointment. Easter is about celebration. It's about wearing pastels. It's about eating chocolate. Cadbury's English chocolate. Don't eat waxy American chocolate. It's all about eating chocolate. And it's all about celebrating Jesus. And here's what I love. They're building up to something that will be this incredible breakthrough. This incredible behold the moment of God. But at this point, they're disappointed. I want to begin our message this Easter by saying it's okay to be disappointed. But it's not okay to live there. You don't have to live there. Point number one, the disappointment. But look at the next few verses. Here we see, and behold, there was a great earthquake. You know what it means when you see the word behold in Scripture? It means stop doing what you're doing and start paying attention to something new. And I love the word behold. In fact, it's the word of my year. Every year I pray about what is a word that will kind of define my year or kind of stir me up, or get me excited about my year. And it's the word behold. What I love here is there's this breaking through of God. There's this breaking through, the earthquake that happens, the angel comes down, the angel's about to roll the stone away. There is a breakthrough. Point number two of our message is we need a breakthrough. Maybe you came to Easter this year needing a breakthrough. This is your last resort. Maybe you said to your spouse, honey, let's just go. It's our last chance. It's our last hope. Or maybe you didn't tell your spouse that, but you came to Easter this year knowing if things don't shift this Easter, this springtime, by this summer, there won't be a relationship. It will be a divorce. It will be a separation. It will be a pain. I'm telling you, don't live in that place of disappointment. We weren't created to live in the grave. We were created to experience life. You were created not to live in a life of suffering, in depravity, and in the grave. In the same way 25 years ago, when I traded my grave, you can trade your grave. Why? Because of behold. Behold, the angel came. His appearance was like lightning. His clothing, white as snow. And for fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. There are boulders over our hearts that we cannot roll away. The angel came, sent by God from heaven. The heavens rendered. The angel came forth. He rolled the stone away. In a moment, Jesus would walk forth from that tomb as a risen, living man. He would walk into town. He would shed the burial clothing. He would walk with bloodied feet all the way back into the community and go, here I am. We'll get to that in just a moment. But here in this situation, we've got to face the reality that there are rocks in our lives that we cannot move. You cannot move your marriage the way you want to. The more you want to, the more you try to, the more you start controlling your life, not embracing a life with God. Don't control your life. If you've got kids and you've got teenagers, you've probably realized at this point by trying to control them, they do everything that you don't want. Raise your hand. I see those hands. I have a whole bunch of teenagers. I have seven kids. I've got five teenagers, I think. And some days it feels like 35 teenagers. I love them. They're incredible. They're my best friends. But they're hard work. And they would say the same thing about me, I'm sure. But we need a breakthrough. We need the Lord to come and roll the stone away. Because if we're not careful, we allow the rocks, the boulders of our hearts to become the very things that begin to define our lives. The rock is, I'm a liar. The rock for you might be, I'm lustful. The rock for you might be, I'm divorced. The rock for you might be, my kids don't want relationship with me. And as much as we want to roll the rock of our life away, we cannot roll that rock away. We need God to come and roll the rock of our lives away. You knew you were coming to Easter, right? You knew you were coming to hear a message like this, but did you really know that you might change today? Did you really know that today might be the day where you say, okay, I'm going to give up trying to roll that rock away and I'm going to trust God because I've got this crazy sense that God wants to do something in your life today. 
Don't look at the person next to you and say, yep, he's talking to you. No, I'm talking to you, sir. <laughs> you, ma'am. I'm talking to you because here's why. You have this rock. We all have these rocks in our lives. The borders of our lives are too big. And if we're not careful, we begin to believe that they're true about our lives. That all I am is a liar. That all I am is lustful. That all I am is divorced. That all I am is separated. That all I am is a stained being. And God says, oh, no, no, no. Behold. I am doing a new thing. Stand still. Stop Snapchatting about the life that you want to have. Stop hashtagging about the tweets that you wish you could live and start embracing the life that God has given to you. That is Easter. That is Easter and we can go through life and we can go through Easter, another Easter and another Christmas and another summer and another fall and go, why is life not getting better? Life gets better following the breakthrough and the victory that your life was never intended to be in the grave. Your life was never intended to be in the darkness of the tomb with the stone in front of you. It was to be lived with the stone rolled away. You are not defined by your story. Yes, they are legitimate issues if you've gone through that pain in any way. It's a legitimate issue, but it's not your story. The cross has the final word and the empty tomb begins the new story. That is the truth of Easter. So the angel says to the woman, yep, I know you're afraid. Don't be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus. He was killed. He was dead, but he is no longer here. Let's face it. If Jesus had only lived and died and that was it, there's nothing spectacular about that. Good people live and die, but Jesus didn't just live, die. He rose again. He wriggled free from the burial wrappings. He walked out as that stone was moved past. He walked past the soldiers that were living, but no, the, 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 I can't talk, that there were no standing as dead men. I'm getting excited. I'm ready to see. Let's just respond right now. Raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. He walked past the soldiers that were living, but like dead men. And he walks in the town and it's crazy because the first thing he says, he sounds like this mild man, mild man Canadian. He goes, greetings. It's crazy. We'll get to that in a moment. But Jesus walks to your life. The first thing the angel says is, don't be afraid. Why do you think he said that? Because she was afraid. What's going on? He goes, don't be afraid. Let me come and show you where he was once. See those? See the shroud, see the clothing, see the burial wrappings. Yep, he's gone. He's gone. See that blood? Yep, look at that trail of blood. Look at this. Come on. The trail of that blood leads right from this tomb right into your heart and then beyond and says, in the exchange of sin, I'll give you righteousness. And that is, again, the purpose of Easter. Jesus was on the comeback tour. He was coming back. Christianity, friends, Christianity is not based upon your ideas or mine. Christianity is not based upon your ideals or mine. Christianity is not based upon debated philosophies on blogs and articles. Christianity is one man, one cross, and one empty tomb. Find yourself in that story. Yes, you have a disappointment, but yes, you can have a breakthrough, which leads me to point number three. Write this down, the relationship the relationship. Go quickly, he says, tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead, verse 7, and behold, there it is again. He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. You can see him today. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to his disciples, verse 9, and behold, I love that. Jesus met them and said, greetings. Always makes me smile that he says, hey, yo, what's up? YOLO, just kidding, you don't just live once. I'm coming back again. And I love this because he just walks up there and he seriously strikes me as this mild-mannered Canadian. Love Canada, lived there for a year, 20 years ago, love it. It's like Jesus just strolls up. Why do you think he does that? Because they would have ran the other way. What? Who? And he goes, hey, yo, wait up for a minute. Seriously, it is me. Here, look. And then what does he say? He says, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, for there they will see me. Even in your darkest moment of being self-centered, even when you have your darkest day of being angry, even when you have your darkest moment of sin, you are not written off. Jesus goes out of his way to walk to you and says, come walk with me. You are not written off because you have a secret affair. You are not written off because you're struggling to trust him. You are not written off because you looked at naked people last night online. You are not written off. Does that grieve the heart of God? Yes. 
And does it destroy your life? Yes. And will it destroy your spouse? Yes. And will it destroy your kids? Yes. But you are not written off. In fact, you are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he says, come, let's do life together. And he says, go tell the disciples, go tell everyone. I'm telling you, when we realize and understand this moment in the boldest paragraph of history, we realize the power of the cross that says we are not good enough. It's not based upon our performance. It's based upon God's performance through Jesus that we are now one to the heart of God. We find peace with God, the Roman letter tells us, through Jesus Christ. And not only that, we receive this abundance of life. I want your life to be abundant. You don't have to leave here today the same way you came, stressed out about your car payments, stressed out about your mortgage, stressed out about your kids, ticked off with your colleague at work, want to move cubicles because you had enough or throw the wrench if you're a plumber, Adam. You don't need to leave that way. You can be changed. You can be changed. I know this personally and I know this because you are surrounded by many, many hundreds of people that have the same story. You don't have to live the way you're living currently. You can live a different life. You are not written off based upon something you have done. Does it grieve the heart of God when you live a life distant from God? Absolutely. That's the reason he created a bridge for us. We can walk across the cross beam of the cross into a new life, into a new relationship. And that is the beauty and the simplicity of the cross. Romans 5, I just mentioned it. Let me read it to you. He says, since all of this has happened, we have peace with God now through Jesus. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace with which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Jesus came and lived and was buried and rose again on the third day to pay the penalty of your sin. And you go, well, I don't sin. Yes, you do. By the sheer fact that you said that statement, you have an issue of arrogance going on. And I won't tell you who might have said that famously in the last 12 months that he doesn't have to ask for forgiveness. We all have to come to the cross and ask for forgiveness. It doesn't matter whether you're in an elected office or whether you're barely staying in your own office. It does not matter. You need Jesus. You need the heart of God to transform your brokenness. He solved, Jesus solved my sin problem. He solved my sin problem. And in exchange of my sin, he gave me his righteousness. And that's what he offers to you today. And it's the power of forgiveness. And you go, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying, this is crazy. You're saying that I don't have to live this way. Yes. You're saying that I don't have to live life defined by my divorce. Yes. I had a woman last night. She looked at me and I said, why are you wanting to get baptized? She said, A, I love God. I just want to spend my time with Jesus. I love Jesus. And she goes, and I want the stain of Mississippi washed from my life. Come on. What I look at her and say, I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. No, I'm like, heck yes, that's going to happen. Because we can change. And I love what it says in 2 Corinthians. If anyone belongs to Jesus, he has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. If I could leave you with one thing this weekend, it would be this one thing. Whatever it is and whatever it takes and wherever you're at, don't leave here today without making it right with God. Don't leave here and go, well, I'm just going to figure it out. I'll figure it out. I'll buy a bigger house. That will solve that problem I once had. I'll earn more money. That will deal with the poverty issues I had growing up. I'll go out and find another girl to prove my ex-wife that I still am wanted. Whatever it is, go ahead. We'll see you at Christmas. We'll talk about the birth of the Savior. This, this Easter, we'll talk about the one that rises again. I'm telling you, don't miss my heart here. Please don't miss my heart here. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live in the place of shame and feeling this stain over your life. Your eyes tell a story. Whether you want to know this or not, your eyes tell a story. Your eyes tell the story of, am I wanted? Did Jesus really do this for me? Your eyes tell a story. Your eyes are a portal into your soul. And Jesus said, yes, let's take that sin. Let's take that shame. Where the world says shame on you. I love what Pastor Evan said on Good Friday. Where the world says shame on you, Jesus says shame off you. Shame off you in Jesus' name. You don't need to live based upon the shame of that story. You don't need to allow your life to have the final word. You can look to the cross to have the final word over your life. And then you can look inside the empty tomb. Look all you want. Try and find the body in there and finally you'll walk out of that empty tomb and be like, yep, it's true. The empty tomb 
tells a new story. That is what I believe for your life. That's what I'm asking God for right now. I'm asking God right now for people to say yes for the very, very first time. I want to receive Him. I'm praying for people in this room right now that feel like they have surrendered their hearts to God, but as much as they have done so, they're now wandering away and wondering if God's got their life. A recommitment, a resurrendering. I'm praying that there will be people in this room right now that would be dressed beautifully for Easter that didn't come with a spare set of clothes, but you're going to jump in this tank here in about five minutes. You're going to say, just try and stop me. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to stop you. Go ahead. But I'm telling you, that is the stirring of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss an opportunity to make it right with God. If you're in the lobby right now and you're like, man, I'm so glad that I'm behind this pillar. He can't see me. I'm telling you, without sounding too spiritual and cliche, the Holy Spirit can see your heart right now. It's banging out of your chest. Respond to God. Whatever you do, make it right with God. If you'd say right now, yeah, yeah. I don't want to live in my disappointment. I want to experience the power of a breakthrough. And point number three, I want to enter into a relationship. And you'd say, yeah, I need to change my life for the very, very first time. And you'd say, yes. I want you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now if you'd say, yes, I want to surrender my life. Yep, 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 yep. My word, there are hands everywhere. Is it dark or are my eyes bad? Yep, there's hands there. Yep, this is good. This is good. Come on, raise your hands. You would say, yes, I need to turn my life over. Yes, I need to surrender my life. Raise your hand. Keep raising your hand. Anyone over this side? Anyone over this side? Don't let that side outdo you. I'm just telling you. Okay, anyone on this side? All right, and now let me ask you this question. You can lower your hands for a moment. You'd raise your hand right now if you would say this. Many Easter's ago, or many years ago, or even many months ago, I surrendered my heart to the Lord, but it's been a hard go, and I want to come back. You turned your back, the Lord never turned His back, but in some ways you've kind of wandered away, and you're wondering where He's at, and He's like, I'm still here. And you'd say, I need to turn around and look to the face of Jesus and re-surrender my heart to the Lord. Would you raise your hand right now with me if you'd say, yeah, I need to re-surrender my heart to the Lord right now. Yep, that's good. Come on, lots of hands. That's good. (laughs) Me too. Me too. Me too. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that in this room right now, to where we have raised our hands to a resurrendering, to where we have raised our hands for the very, very first time, Lord, we would find someone out. We would search someone out to really walk through the process of what does it mean to deal with our life, to not allow our lives to be defined by the stain of our past, but by the compelling invitation of a new day. Help us find people out. Help us search them out, Lord. We ask for forgiveness for our sin. Forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for what we said. Forgive us for what we did. Forgive us for what we didn't say or didn't do. Lord, forgive us. And in the place of our sin, would you give us your righteousness? Come on. I'd encourage you, if you raise your hand in the last few moments, if you have the app downloaded on your phone, take a moment. It'll only take you a few seconds. Click on the app and open it up. And it says, I said yes. I said yes. Click on I said yes. Take two minutes. Write your name, your last name, and your email. That's all we're asking for. It's your email address and your name. Heck, you give that to Costco. Give it to Jesus. Give it to the Lord and start a life. Start something different in your life so we can follow up and walk you through a journey of breakthrough and salvation. I don't want you to come back next weekend and go, man, boy, dodged a bullet last weekend, didn't stand. I want you to come back next weekend and say, man, something happened in my life and I'm back and I want more. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and I need Jesus. That's the reason I'll be here next weekend. Not because I'll be like, oh, get to do it again. No, because Jesus drives us to declare the love and the beauty and the splendor of the glorious, powerful name of Jesus. That's what will change you. If you would be here right now and you say, man, I didn't sign up to get baptized, but I showed up and hey, whatever, I'm just going to do it. I want to invite you to come. Come get baptized. We haven't got a spare change of clothes for you. You'll be leaving this place in wet clothes. But what a story. Just go into the coffee shop and walk in and say it's raining outside or do something. But like, come get baptized. I'm telling you. Don't miss the opportunity. You say, well, well, why would I do that? Because it seals. It is a public demonstration of this new private commitment that you're making to be a new person. You can be a new person. If you raise your hand, I'm proud of you. If you're going to get baptized, I'm proud of you. Regardless, I am so thankful for you. Don't let your story define you. Let the cross have the final word and let the empty tomb tell the new story. Tell the new story. All right.